you. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a uh, piece of work that I've been doing for, well, depending on how you count, for several years or for only the past year that I decided to do actually something uh, interesting about it. So this is a, a piece of work that I have been doing. I started doing it about eight <coughs> years ago, primarily as a consulting um, deal with a company in Sweden that does urban simulations and for whom I pretty much sort of uh, was the main maintainer and kind of developer of their simulation framework. Um, and so we, you know, we did uh, lots of things all these years and then th it got to a point about two years ago that uh, I really needed to do something to solve some of the problems that we were encountering because uh, it was clearly what whatever we had was not really scaling up. So let me tell you what the problems are and uh, and the, this framework that uh, my students and I are kind of converging to. Um, so so uh, let me talk to you about the, the domain of uh, uh, complex time-stepped simulations, which is the domain that, you, that uh, this application is, is on. So we want uh, to simulate, in this case, cities. And I talk I'm talking about kilometer square, more over kilometer square areas. Um, where we want um, rich visualizations, but so that's sort of a component that comes on top of the data, right? Uh, we want uh, to be able to um, to have rich models of the data. That's what that's the purpose of the simulation, and, and rich models of how the data behaves dynamically as time goes by. So you can imagine that the cities is really easy to to uh, understand because everybody knows what a city is, everybody has an intuitive feeling for how you would simulate a city, right? Uh, or at least what you would like to see when you simulate a city. There's you know, traffic simulation, there's the buildings, there's uh, pedestrians, there's perhaps the environmental issues uh, with the, there's, there's perhaps the also energy um, aspect of, uh, of the energy distribution, uh, you, the weather influences everything else. So th basically, there's an open-ended number of what I call aspects. This is going up under me. Uh, aspects of a city, and this uh, ties back to my old work on aspect-oriented programming, but it, it actually pretty much is the same thing. It's the same concept. You have these aspects of the city, and they are all interrelated. They are not completely independent. They, they are fairly independent, but not completely, because ultimately you have you are working over the same state. Now, some aspects work on parts of that state. Other aspects of the, of, of work on other parts of that state, and that's where the interesting dependencies come from, right? So, this picture that I have in this slide, I didn't do this. This is a picture that I took from uh, Fujimoto's from a talk from Fujimoto. He's a one of the most well-known uh, researchers in uh, distributed simulation. And, um, and uh, so he basically did this slide as you know, a story for aspect-oriented architectures in some, some way or another, right? I don't need to do it myself. So they, the, the people who do urban simulations are already thinking in, in terms how do how, how do we even do stuff like that? Now, the interesting thing about that I've learned as I became more aware of the work in uh, distributed simulations is that the, the community that does simulation doesn't necessarily know a lot about software engineering <laughs> or software architecture. <laughs> right? They know very well, very much about simulations, models, you know, agent-based simulations, you name it, lots of, uh, lots of cool techniques. But when it comes to actually figuring out how do, do we put all these things together, they don't necessarily have uh, the right experience and the right background to, to kind of answer that question. So, um, let me just show you the kinds of environments that uh, I uh, that have been building with this uh, company in, um, in in Sweden that that I have been consulting for. So hopefully this will work. Sometimes the video goes somewhere else. Let's see. Um, see. Always have trouble. Uh, how do I end the video here? Thank you. 
I fail. There's a cool vision of all who try something else, maybe. Okay, this also doesn't work. Okay, all right. Well, I would love to show you a demo or a video, but uh, I'm having trouble here with the media and PowerPoint and the different this uh, virtual dis desktops on my computer. But basically, this is a picture, there's a movie here, of how these environments look like in this company. So this company comes into a city, they model the parts of the city where there are redevelopment projects, and model by modeling, I think, th they, they, I mean, they build the 3D models of the buildings, the roads, whatever is there. And then uh, we, and then uh, one of the things that I do is provide things like traffic simulation. You see the things over here, traffic simulation, pedestrian simulation, and eventually different kinds of traffic, um, and uh, eventually different other kinds of simulation that the, that the cities or the client, the real estate developers might be interested. In. Um, and so this is this is these are very large areas. Okay, these are like. Kilometer. This one is Uppsala. I don't know if any of you can uh, uh, recognize. This is the area around the station in Uppsala. And this one is one of the, well, now we have bigger models, but this one is three kilometers by one and a half. So it's very, very large. Um, and when you go into things that are very, very large, one of the things that comes up is, um, uh, well, it doesn't fit in one computer. And uh, that's because you have a lot of models. These, uh, these uh, meshes are are very large, there's a lot of stuff going on, so you kind of have to partition things. So partitioning things is going to be a theme here in my talk. Um, so uh, this is where the distributed simulation comes from. And uh, w w one thing that I learned in doing these systems is uh, uh, techniques that come from the gaming industry, because when you go and uh, implement uh, like multi massive multi-user uh, environments, you have exactly the same problem, right? And they are way ahead. They have done amazing work, engineering work, on how to support, you know, thousands of users uh, sharing the same space. Uh, so one of the things that they do for, for um, one of the traditional uh, techniques for dealing with uh, partitioning of load is to, uh, and especially when you're dealing with 3D spaces, is to partition the 3D space into a grid. So, so you partition the, the city into a grid, and now each of these cells is simulated by a different server, different core, right? different process. And, and now there is some, and then there's some sort of a handoff, handoff here of data that goes between the border, but uh, that's all good, right? So, so, and then if you have visualizations, have viewers, for example, uh, then what, what you do is that the viewers opens connections to all of the things that it can see, right? And then the data comes all from these different servers to the, to the viewer. And the viewer is the one that kind of makes the, the illusion of a, a, a very large space. Okay, that's the technique, standard techniques that comes from the gaming industry. Um, so, for example, Second Life is exactly that works exactly like this. I don't know how many of you know Second Life, but it works exactly like this. Um, so, so if you have, for example, one one car here, if you're doing uh, a traffic simulation in this kind of partitioning, you have a car that now is currently being simulated by this cell of the space, and now the car moves over the border. Um, there is a, a, a migration of of data of the objects, th one server sends the, you know, the car to the other server, and then once, once it crosses, then this other server is the one that simulates the car, okay? So this is all uh, kind of standard um, distributed system stuff. Uh, now there's some problems, and thi by the way, this is the first architecture which I inherited, um, so th I should give you just a, a little background. The infrastructure that I use for these simulations is a, an open source version of Second Life. Um, so we, we basically re-implemented the server side of Second Life from scratch. Um, and, uh, and so th this is basically the architecture that that system has. Okay? So this is the first uh, version of my traffic simulation was exactly this. I just, I had the different 
cars being simulated by whatever exactly they were, and if they cross the border, then there will be a, you know, a handover of the data to the other server. So there's many problems with this, with this, pro with this uh, architecture. One problem is that the migration across the border causes some visual, visual quirks, right? That takes a little time to actually pass the data. And if you want smooth transitions, then you have to go into a lot of trouble to actually fake the, la the, the, the latency in there. Um, there was there actually another, another kind of problems that, as you will see, turned out to be even more important than, than the visual quirks, which is when we are doing these um, models, okay, so this system works both as a, a, vi a base for visualizing a simulation, but it's also an editor. So the modelers put go in and uh, edit the scene. They, they put the, the, um, the 3D model in there. It's sort of as a, you know, a, as the previous speaker would say, it's a, a 3D editor. It's a Google Docs for 3D. <laughs> okay? So it's a shared space where people can uh, collaboratively add 3D, 3D models, okay? And so when the modelers were, were doing their modeling, um, and, and I was doing my traffic simulation, and, uh, you know, as things go, the traffic simulation had bugs, or I, I needed to improve something, and every time that I needed to deploy a new version of the traffic simulation, I had to kick them out, right? Because now it's one, one core, one server that has everything, the 3D models, the, the cars, you name it. And now if I want to, de to, to update one of the aspects, all of those aspects are going to go down. And that started to be a small annoyance, and it turned out to be a, the major annoyance of them all. Because it was extremely disruptive. People would, were working on it, and then suddenly they had to stop for half an hour or whatever, and, and, uh, and this was really, really annoying. Uh, so th that was one of the parts that I, I really said, okay, well I need to do something about it, okay? So let me, let me, not, be, let me not invade their modeling space. And uh, what I'm going to do is to separate my traffic simulation. I'm just going to have one dedicated process that all it does is traffic simulation. And it's I just, I'm just going to fake, because it, the viewer is the one that actually fakes everything, I'm just going to fake it and make the viewer believe that the cars are where they actually are. They, they are simulated by the server on the side, but they are lo uh, you know, logically placed in the model area, right? So it's just a matter of, of playing with the coordinates of where the cars are. Uh, okay, so this was a great idea. Um, so th there it is, there's a, f a traffic simulator, there's another process that runs somewhere, and all it does is traffic simulation, so it just needs to have a model of the roads, and that, that's all it needs to, to run the, the cars. Um, and the modelers are here, and, and basically the cars are not, th these servers don't know anything about the cars. These servers here have the people building it, but they don't know anything about the cars. The only thing that they know is that they know about the traffic simulation. So that wha when somebody connects to this model area, they get notified that there's this other server that they should also know about so that the data flows up. Okay? So this, this, was, this was great. Um, uh, so, but um, this solved the, the main problem. But, there, but this brought another problem because now I, I got comfortable with this idea of faking things in other servers, so I got very ambitious. I wanted to start separating things, right? Now I had a pedestrian simulation, and I, you know, it's relatively independent from the car simulation, so I'm just going to put another server on the side that all it does is pedestrians, right? And maybe I'm going to put another server on the side that all it does is, ac is simulating um, this cool pod car system, which I know I don't know very much about, but there's another engineer in in Sweden who actually knows a lot about pod cars and has his own pod car simulation. So I wanted to give him, okay, so just do your pod car simulation on the side, right? Everybody's sort of independent. Uh, so and and so, so it, it then when I started to get ambitious, I started to get into more trouble. And what what was the trouble? The problem is that now there is these data dependencies that if I want to do a car simulation and a pedestrian simulation and the pedestrian crosses the road, as pedestrians do, now what? If, they, if the cars and the pedestrians don't know about each other, you know, this magic component that puts everything together, just, you know, bang, there's a collision right there. 
Uh, and uh, the same thing with all the other things. So basically, this, the simulation as a whole has these dependencies that are absolutely unavoidable. And now we have to deal with them, right? And if I started separating all these aspects, and, uh, and uh, you know, the standard way of doing is that I just create APIs all over the place. And for every two components that need to know about each other, there's an API between them. Okay, this is API hell. Uh, it was starting to look like this. And I did not want to go here. This is the part where I just decided, okay, this is, there's some fundamental problem here that uh, I need to think a little bit more careful about how I'm going to do this. Um, so this is, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was going to get very hairy. So I, I pushed back, I, I, I sat back and decided to actually talk about this with my students and come up with something slightly different. Try something slightly different. And then the thing that, that we come up with is a, Fundamentally, a data-oriented architecture. So it's an architecture where the components don't know about each other. All they know is about a common data model. Right? They know about the data objects that exist in the shared space. That's all they know. And, and they, they use those objects however they need. They don't even need to coordinate how those objects are used. They, 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 they just have, they find their own views of the objects that they, that they need to function. So it's basically, you know, it's a cauldron that includes a lot of influences from one, one of the most uh, prominent ones is the tuple spaces. I don't know how many of you remember tuple space, but this idea there's a shared data space that, you know, you put and pull things from that data space. Another, um, influence that I'm going to talk about is the influence of dependent types, and you'll see where, where this comes from. Another one is this idea of differential computation, or basically framed computations, which is something absolutely fundamental in simulations and in this virtual environment, in games, for all of you, who, whoever has programmed the game, there's this idea that there's this frame, right? At every tick, there's, there's, this, there's this constant tick, 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 and every tick, you update the state. That's how games work. So that, that's basically this idea of the differential computations that are, that are coming up. So let me talk about just a big picture over here. So um, okay, what's this idea of the space-time framework? It is literally a space-time framework. <laughs> so it's a there's the concept of, of space as in the state that lives, okay, and and there's the concept of time in terms of these ticks. <coughs> uh, now the the so there's a s the shared data space, and now there's these independent computations. They're called these framed computations. And they all go to the store to get the uh, data and put data back. Um, they are all independent, as I said. All they need to know is the data model of what's in the data space. That's all they need to know. But they, all they can all tick at different, they don't need to be synchronized in ticking. Okay, they can all tick at their own speeds, whatever they need. Um, in fact, some of them can be short-lived. Some of them you can just start something for a little bit and just go away, right? You can have a short-lived simulation as well as you can have a long-lived um, uh, computation too. So uh, I will talk about the different aspects of this. I just wanted to give you a, a first uh, overall picture. I'll come back to it after I dive down in some of the more some of the details. So basically, there's two parts to it. The, the two parts to it uh, is really two domain specific languages that we are working on. Um, we, we're actually, the first implementation of this is in Python. So these DSLs are implemented as uh, the Python annotations, whatever they're called. Uh, what they call in Python? Declarators, right. So uh, the, um, uh, there's two parts. So there's the frame processing component, okay, there's a little language for defining, basically, for declaring what are the objects that these um, computations need and how, whether they need it just for reading, for reading and updating, for take, for actually removing. So basically, the normal kind of operations over a data store in general, and and this is declarative. Okay, and then there's also the interface with the data space, wi which is uh, something that we call the object frames, and uh, and. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about this. It's basically every time that you go to the fra to the data space, you go and grab a bunch of, of data, but when you import it, you import it as objects. 
object that makes sense for the computation. Right? And the same data, same raw data in the shared data space can go to do different computations using completely different types. Okay? Because one computation needs a certain type out of the data and another needs a certain other type out of the data. And I'll, I'll explain more about it. So let me dive in. So what do I mean by the first, well, I'm going to start with the first one, the frame processing component. Um, so what is this? So basically, I, I really I, I'm, I'm dealing with time step computation. So what this means is that th you know, there's a function somewhere and, and basically on a, on a timer, constant timer, there's a tick and you run that tick. And if, if this can go forever or just for a little while, but th that, that's how these uh, time step computations go. And the idea here is that um, there's data in in the beginning and there's data out at the end. And that's all. That's those are all the two points at which these frame computations interact with the data store. Okay? Um, so in the middle of the computation, there's I complete isolation. There's no interfacing with the shared data store. It's only in the beginning and at the end of each of these frames, time frames. Okay? So some constraints that we have here on, on this uh, update function is that, uh, that we don't, we don't uh, spawn threads and, uh, and basically there, I there is no access to the data store. We don't even have an API for accessing the data store yeah, directly. Okay? So it's, it's there's complete isolation of the, of the data during a period of time in each of the frame computations that need the data, okay? So let me, let me give you a very concrete example. So here's a traffic simulation. This is written in Python, okay? There's a traffic simulation. Um, uh, each of these, so it inherits from I applications. So each of these I applications need to implement a init, so the, uh, sorry, the init is just a constructor. Need to implement the initialize method and an update method, okay? There's also a shutdown method, but I don't have it here. So the initialization is obvious what it does. It's something that runs when this application starts. And then the update method is the one that gets called on every tick. Okay? So, uh, but what I want you to point out is that the, declar the declarations on top of this application, okay? Th these are the declarations about what kind of data does this computation need and how. So in this case, I'm saying that this is a producer of cars, and uh, we also have a, uh, an argument that you know we can have many data stores, can have ma you know can be distributed data stores. So in this case, the default is a local host, so this can be come from many other places, and actually from many places. So you could get data from many data stores. So it's a producer of cars. And it's a consumer and updater, so getter setter, of uh, two other types um, called inactive car and active car, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about these types in a little bit. Okay? So just to tell you that this is a, these are declarations about what data is used by this application and how. Okay? And that's all. The, uh, during the update loop, there's, there's a sort of an assumption that there are you know, this update loop has the power to add cars to the simulation and the power to, to get cars from the simulation and to update the properties of, of I'm sorry, get act inactive cars and active, and active cars and the power to update the properties of active and inactive cars. That's what it says, okay? <coughs> there is no explicit sending and pulling data. That's, that's implicit. That's what the framework does. And it does it underneath in the beginning and at the end of the update loop. Okay? <coughs> so here's so that was the, the car simulation. Here's another component, for example, a pedestrian simulation that declares that it's a producer of pedestrians and it's a getter setter of stops of pedestrians, walker, and an interesting type called car and pedestrian nearby. That you can already imagine what this means, right? These things are on the verge of collision. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit, bit more about these types in a little bit. Just, just to tell you what, how, how these frame computations look like and how you define them, okay? So 
Uh, let me move it then into these in these types that I've been kind of hinting at. What 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 are they? So the, the what the idea is that first let me let me back track a little bit. This architecture is actually I decades old. Okay, there's there's very little new in here. In that, if you see, if you look at web application, I mean, you name it. This is basically what you have when you have a data-intensive application. You have a data store somewhere, and you have many components that use that data store, right? There's that's what everybody converges because that's sort of what works. Uh, the, the thing that is really different in here is that I want this this interface with the data store to be really constrained, okay? I don't want these crazy SQL queries in the middle of the code, right? I, I, I want really constrained interactions with the data store. So one constraint is that it's only in the beginning and at the end, right? But the other constraint is that I also want to make the kinds of data that is pulled and pushed, I want it to be a part of the data model. And this is a little subtle. So basically what I'm saying is that you know, when you do a, a SQL-based application, you, ha you define your types, your, your row, you know, your tables with the, the columns and whatnot, and whatnot, and then you let the program sort of ad hocly define queries over that data, right? I don't want that because those queries are actually quite meaningful for applications. When you have, when you go to a, a data store and you have cars in there and you pull the cars to velocity zero. That means something for the application, usually. That, that's an important concept. That's, that's an inactive car. That's a car that is stopped. And I want to capture that in the data model of my application. Because for all sorts of reasons, because that's the reason why the declarative the approaches is, are so good. Because you, you can see the intentions much, much better in the data model then having to look into the code and figuring out what are these predicates that, that are going on, and you don't even have a name for them, right? So having these queries be p somehow part of the data model was something that I really, really, really wanted. So these types include the queries, okay? So let me explain. Uh, so basically, <coughs> it w it's something that we call predicate collection classes. Um, there's a paper on this that's coming up pretty soon on the uh, uh, Jordan and, and John. Uh, so it's inspired by dependent type. And uh, so a, a dependent type is, is a type that is predicated um, upon a dynamic value. Or my definition is a stat the static entities about the dynamic properties of the object. So th this is wha where I'm coming from. So let me show you an example. I think it's going to be more clear. So here's a, here's a class car. Okay, and it has... I have these annotations, the dimensions that, that uh, you know, you can have lots of properties of the class car, but some of them are actually part of this language that, are, that we're designing. So I, I tag them as dimensions, okay? So it has a, a, an ID, a position, a velocity, you can have more things. And here's another class, active car, which I, I declare to be a subset of car. I want active cars to be subsets of cars. And how are they subsets? Well, so they, they um, define a predicate. Okay, this is my predicate for defining what kinds of cars do I want. What's in this subset? And in this particular case, are they are the, the cars that the velocity is not zero and, and, uh, and it's also not minus. Okay, so those are, these are the active, active cars. This is my predicate. And this is my type. Okay, so when I get when my frame computation gets active cars, it's guaranteed that it's got the cars that were at that moment on the data store with velocities not null and not zero. Okay? It's got all of those types. This is what we call predicate collection classes because they are collections with this, with this, with this predicate. See, let me give another example. So here's another example. This one's not pedestrians and, and cars, but it's related. So here's a person with many dimensions, 12, you know, 20 dimensions, name and ID, lots of other things for the person. And now I'm, deci I'm defining a projection of that person type over two dimensions, ID and name, okay? 
And I, I declare this to be a type person info. As I said, person info is a type of my application, and it's just a projection type. It, it's all, all the persons, but only those two dimensions of the person. Okay? I could have a more sophisticated predicate here, so I, I can mix um, projections with subsetting to you know, building the pre pre predicate. So, so ju just some exa examples. Um, we have a, a complete. Uh, we are working towards complete support of, of relational algebra. So there's subsets, there's projections, there's joins, there's unions, intersections. So those are all things that uh, uh, relational algebra has, and SQL follows relational algebra very closely. And we are just following the footsteps of of what has gone before. We're not really reinventing the wheel. What we're doing here is making these explicit types in the data modeling of the application. Now, you may say, that let me tell you even before you ask, um, that there are some interesting issues in here. One of the issues is the state, what you do with the state. Right? We're in an imperative world. You get the data, for example, you get an inactive car, um, or you get an active car from the store, Right, you import an active car, so it had the velocity uh, not zero, and now this component is going to stop the car. Okay, put the velocity zero, for example, like that. And so at that point, this car object has actually effectively stopped being an active car. Right, it, it violates the predicate that got it in this collection in the first place. Right. So now, what do I do? I have some options here. We thought about what should we do. So one option would be to follow uh, the old work on predicate classes. I don't know if some of you remember. It's an old paper at Fuchsla from um, um, Craig Chambers, Chambers, I think, on predicate classes, which is basically a same idea that we're talking about here. But the idea is that in, in a, I, the idea is that o the objects of those classes are always true to their predicates. So if you change something in the state, then that object may change the class immediately, right? So if you violate the predicate and you you know you put velocity zero, then this would stop being an active car immediately. There would always be a check that that it reclassifies the object uh, right then and there. So we thought about it, and we thought, and we, uh, this, this is something that I actually did not want. I thought this was a really terrible idea if it behaved like that, because we want some guarantee. We want this frozen. We want this isolation. We want the data. We got the data from the data store, and now what happens in here? I don't want things to be reclassified under my belt. Okay, I want these objects. They were part of a collection. I want them to be still be part of a collection. And and if you think about it, after you know, this is what I wanted. But now I had to justify why would I put this in my design? People are going to shoot me, right? These objects are just not uh, violating the their invariant. And and if I try to submit a paper somewhere, people are just going to shoot me because you know academics don't like that kind of stuff. Uh, so but then I, I th we thought a little harder, and uh, as it turns out, that this kind of decision is already out there, everywhere, in many different forms. Let me tell you one. When you get, when you are iterating over a collection in Java, C Sharp, Python, you name it, all the major languages, you have a collection and you iterate through the collection. Now, as you iterate through the collection, you may actually change the state of the object. I, and it might be that you actually would want to remove that object from that collection, right? Because something in that object stopped being valid and, and it shouldn't belong in that collection anymore. Now, what does the language tell you? Does most of these languages tell you? You can't do that, right? You can't do that. Yeah, it's an, iter an iteration exception of some sort, right? So wh what you end up doing is <coughs> that you end up putting, uh, flagging those objects, putting them in another collection, right? <laughs> so you first iterate through the original collection, and then if something changed, you put those objects that you don't want there, you put them in another collection, and then you iterate again through that collection, and you delete them from the other collection, right? That's the technique there. So th these ideas of, of uh, slight violations of, of the, the, you know, the, the nature of the object in collections, they're already out there. 
They're also out there, for example, in things like uh, um, the hash code. Right? If, you, if you use some sort of a sorted collection and you have the object in a certain slot of that, of that sorted collection, and now something in the state of the object changes, right? and it doesn't belong in that position anymore. But it, that is not, the object doesn't get out of there until something explicit is done, that it gets reclassified somewhere in that collection. Okay, so I, I find I found uh, uh, comfort <laughs> in this idea that uh, that th the fact that we're violating that we're violating the predicate of, of the object um, temporarily in this isolated space is not a big deal because that is already being done in many other contexts. <coughs> so we've embraced that. Okay, it's actually a feature. We don't want objects to be reclassified from under us in this isolated environment. It's only the classification and reclassification of where which in which collections the object belongs is something that happens at the interface of the shared space and the component. It does not happen in the isolated components. It happens in the interface. So that's the design principle. Um, so as I said, we have uh, uh, support for success projections, uh, joins, um, pointing in. We are working on s intersections and unions right now. They're not completely done yet. Um, so coming back to, to the, the big picture, um, this is what I have. So basically the, the architecture is an architecture like m all other, uh, you know, sort of data-backed architectures with a data store at the on the back uh, on back end with the details being pardon me that that the interface here is is kind of interesting uh, with these um, dependent types or you know the predicate collection classes as being sort of the declarative way of pulling and pushing data out of the store um, so there's an issue of performance right <laughs> you may want to immediately tell me how the hell do you want to do high performance simulations if at every single tick you're going to pull data from the store and push data back to the store. Right? That seems extremely inefficient. And in fact, it is. So let me show you some, some charts here. Let me, I'll, I'll show you a bunch of them, and uh, this is how you have to read them. So this is, a, a this is some benchmarks that we have developed to kind of figure out, because we then we, we started realizing, well, yes, the naive implementation is super inefficient, right? But the good thing is that the model is such that it's, it's very prone to lots of optimization, actually very simple optimization that can slash the time by orders of magnitude. So let me, sh let me show you. So this we have the benchmark consists of you have one producer component, so basically a component that produces some object and puts it on the data store. <laughs> and you have another, so uh, this producer, the producer uh, component the at every update does a push and a pull, okay? It's a producer and a getter setter, so it's a push and a pull all at every update. Th and you have another component that just gets a pull, so it's a, t it's a, get a getter of the object, okay? And this scenario is uh, just a, a set of objects uh, with, uh, so the, p the consumer does a push and a pull, but in the update loop, nothing is up actually updated. Okay, there's no updates to the state of the object, okay? So in a very naive implementation of this idea, you would get, so that's the baseline, that's the blue line. This would be a completely naive implementation that you would actually always do as, you, as the function name says. So you're pulling and you're pushing. So we would pull the data every time and we'll push the data at the end of the loop. Okay? That is really, it is very inefficient. That's the blue one. But the good thing is that you can detect very easily whether things have been updated or not. So if nothing gets changed, then nothing needs to get pushed back, right? And if on the other, on the server side, if the server side also detects that nothing got updated, then nothing needs to be sent, you know, pulled back again from the, th this same application again. So this is relatively easy, easy to detect when you actually need to pull and push. And, and, and you know, if nothing changed, then you just cut. You just use the cut things that you already have. So that this is what the other, and we have this experimented with different kinds of optimizations. The one <coughs> that we have now, the best one that we are working is the one that we call data frame. 
um, that does uh, basically um, de detection of what has changed uh, down to the to the properties of the object, to individual properties. And so when something changes, of when something of the object changes, it just spins the pieces of the object that actually changed. Okay? And it also, the data frame uh, uh, optimization is, is also working for the dependent types. Okay, so it's also aware of dependent types that does the right thing on the dependent types, not just on the sets, not just on the, on the basic set. So, so basically, you know, if you, if you use those kinds of very simple optimizations, then it actually nothing is transferred. It's great. Uh, and uh, same thing here for the consumer. So let me show, but now the, the types are actually interesting. So here's a set, <coughs> here's a set with updates, okay? So this is the scenario where the update loop of the consumer actually changes some property of the object. It ch changes one of the properties of the object. Okay, so, so now if you didn't have uh, any optimizations, it, it would be bad, as bad as before, by the way. But now with optimizations, you can actually flush the data that gets passed around. Okay, so in this, in this case, what you see here, you know, the reason why it's not zero is because it's passing a little bit of the object. And now we're working, we're, we're working on the serialization. Now it's a matter of working on the serialization mechanisms to actually make this really efficient. And this is a, an example of projection. I, can be, I have more charts that will benchmark projections and subsets and all that stuff, so <coughs> maybe I don't have time here. Uh, uh, so basi basically the main, uh, the main message here is that uh, the, this simple model that uh, we're actually, it's an interesting programming model. It, it, it would be extremely inefficient if you implement it in a very naive way. But the good thing is that it is completely prone and ripe for all sorts of optimizations that completely flush the amount of data that is passed around. And it only passes the exactly the data that you need to pass around. <coughs> all right, so some experiences. That we had a distributed uh, course on distributed simulations with some students, just some pictures from their car. So the idea is that each of the students, so we have a shared city, and each of the students would make a type of, uh, traffic, si of traffic. So somebody was doing Uber cars, uh, others were doing regular cars, I was doing Amazon delivery trucks. And uh, so, so they were actually able to, uh, to, uh, to use the framework and several of them putting their cars on the, on, you know, on, on the shared space. We didn't get to the point of actually avoiding each other because we ran out of time. We were developing space time at the same time that the students were using it, <laughs> take, you know, debugging the whole thing. That was quite interesting. Uh, but uh, more importantly, I'm also de deploying this now on, on the part on Spark Dialog uh, infrastructure and basically replacing this absolutely horrible, scary thing with uh, something that is much nicer. And I'm using, I'm actually, I'm using it for a lot more than just the real-time simulation. I'm using it for also connecting things like the, uh, the OpenStreetMap editor to the shared space. So there's all sorts of cool, really cool stuff that you can do once you, you decouple the components in this sort of data-oriented uh, dependency. Uh, so, all right, so uh, I'd love to talk to you about other things that are going on, that have been going on in this space. One of them is called HLA, the High Level Architecture, that it's a standard put out by the, the US military some years ago that is cover, tries to cover the same kind of uh, problem. Um, uh, so, um, here's just my concluding. The, uh, my wonderful students, Rohan and Arthur, are the ones who have been working on this. And uh, we are, there's space time. The, the PCC part is an independent project. It's used as a library in space time. And uh, if you can try it out, you can try it out. Thank you.